Welcome to Talks at Google. Uh, I am Kevin Valk, and I'm going to be your host for today. Uh, I'd like to welcome the cast and creative crew uh, from Big Hero 6. So we have Chris Williams and Don Hall, directors. Ryan Potter, Hero. Jamie Chung, Go Go Tomango. Genesis Rodriguez, Honey Lemon. And Roy Conley, producer. Hey guys. Hello, what's up? Hi. Who's the Fallout Boy fan? Oh man. Uh, is that marketing? Uh, no, I mean it was just a suggestion from our, our music department, and you know we met them, and they're like super cool, and love uh, they love Disney, and they love comic books a lot too. So they were like the perfect choice. No, it's a, it's a great film. Now, how many of you in the room saw the film last night when we showed it? It, it, it was it was cool. great. We did a screening for the Google people. People loved it. Families loved it. You know, the theater was packed. It was right. it was a beautiful, beautiful film. So, and Don, you were on it from mm -hmm. the very beginning, right? Three and a half so years. Your pitch. Ago. Yeah, three and a half years ago. Uh, I was finishing up Winnie the Pooh, and uh, um, I just talked to John about what my next thing would be. And and as a kid, I loved Disney animation. I loved Marvel comics, and and we had just purchased Marvel. Disney had. And so I I pitched that to John, and he got really excited and said, "Go find something. Go." <laughs> and, uh, um, and I did a lot of research and, and found Big Hero 6 and, and felt like they were kind of the perfect choice for us. I mean, it's a very obscure title you yeah. know, in the Marvel sort of pantheon, but uh, which actually ended up benefiting us, I think, a little bit. But I love the characters. I love the, you know, the, the whole thing was very light and on, light on its feet. And the thing is like a love letter to sort of Japanese pop culture. And we also saw that there could be an emotional story there, too. So had kind of all the elements we were looking for. No, absolutely. And, and John Lasseter, he's always got his radar up for people's passions. Yeah. And when he sensed how excited Don was about the idea of pursuing a Marvel property, he really, he really got behind him. Great. And then, Roy, when did you come onto the project? I came on the project about a year ago, and basically we kind of wrapped everything up in terms of pulling together the story. It was a, it was a long process, and literally we, we finished the film about 15 days ago. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and <laughs> we Paint's pretty finished, wet on it, man. <laughs> we finished the, the, the story process probably sometime in August, so oh, wow. it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a nice one. Okay, and Ryan, our uh, hero of the story. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I came on about a year and six months ago. Okay. Um, this is your first uh, voice acting role, right? This is my first voice acting role, yeah. And um, it, it's funny because the most, the, like the last recording session was maybe a month ago <laughs> that we had. Yeah, so. But that's the story process of Disney, right? Yeah. Disney's really just always. figuring out the story, always yeah. changing, always kind totally. of. Totally. And, and Laster, better. Yeah, Laster has a phrase. He says, our films are never finished, they're just released. <laughs> and so the film true. isn't finished. Uh, yeah, we, could, <laughs> so we still could go back. <laughs> yeah. That's great. And then, Genesis, uh, you, guys, you guys came on at what point in the film? And I believe I auditioned last November. Okay. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I can't believe. It's gone by so quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blur. <laughs> and you mostly live action because you started off kind of your big kind of hit was Entourage, really, and then you kind of came on with Last Stand and Identity Theft and Hours, and you work with these incredible people and and teams, and then you come into Disney into this this voice acting role. So, uh, what was that like in terms of doing the voice as opposed to acting in front of live real actors? See, I've always been a Disney fan, so mm. they did me a huge favor <laughs> by giving okay. me this job because you're it's welcome. Like a dream thing. <laughs> Thank you. All Chris. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chris. Well, I heard, you, fun fact, I hear that you were on an all-girls robotics team in high school, That's and you're true. a self-proclaimed nerd. Yes. Do we have to talk about this? Yes. <laughs> um, I was on a robotics team, and I did uh, basically robot wars. And um, I was a welder, and um, I gave the robot commands. Um, I really wasn't into the physics aspect of it, but um, or a driver. I don't drive in real life, so um, <laughs> they didn't give me the robot um, to take care of, but it was so much fun. It was just the coolest thing I've ever done. So then what was the transition into acting then? I don't know how it translates. Um, I don't know what the similarities <laughs> are. I guess it's having an idea and, and being able to express it or execute it. Um, it, it was just really cool to just think of something and be able to create it and make it actually tangible. So um, I, I had the best time. I, I kind of love seeing 
the boys' faces when an all-girls robotics team just would walk up and they wouldn't think that we were so badass, but we were. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys know this before? I didn't. I mean, it came, I mean, we. I think we. she already had the part and then we were just talking. She's like, oh yeah, I was on an all-girls robotics. And then they'd be like, what? <laughs> uh, because I actually met on a research trip um, uh, back east at Carnegie Mellon, I met the Girls of Steel which was a high school all-girls robotics team. And their, their um, logo was like Rosie the Riveter with like mm -hmm. a cyborg arm. That was really cool. Um, and again, I was just struck by their spirit. And, uh, and a lot of that, you know, we tried to get into the characters of Honey, Lemon, and Go-Go. You know, just that idea of this can-do. They're all makers. They're all scientific. They're all super smart and enthusiastic. And that really influenced those two characters. Okay. And J Jamie, so you're a San Francisco native. Yes, I am. Wow, so you're from here. So what part of San Francisco? Uh, born and raised in Westwood Park, like okay. right by Monterey and Miramar, yeah, yeah. like kind of my city called. So was it very, was it interesting? Because this is a beautiful, beautiful film, and you really captured the city, and, and it's incredible. Was it cool kind of seeing San Francisco in an animated to form? Be on I mean, to be honest, I, I didn't really know how the world was going to look like. And right away, it's so recognizable. You know, all the, all the, like, all the great landmarks are there. So like the Transamerica Building and the Golden Gate Bridge and, and Market Street, it's, it's really surreal because you don't get that feeling when you're in a recording booth. No, it's, it's, right. I want to talk about that because it was, it's a beautiful, beautiful film. And it's really, it looks like you basically took the footprint of San Francisco yeah. and then you just added all the aesthetics of yeah. Tokyo, Tokyo and just, yeah. it's, it's gorgeous stuff. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, we started with basically a computer model of San Francisco. So we, all, we started with sort of the baseline, the geography. Or, and geographically, it was always going to be San Francisco. So we spent a lot of time in Tokyo doing research trips as well and, and just try to get as much uh, of that in there. And, and we were just in Japan like a week ago for the world premiere. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of uh, Japanese press coming up to us and saying how uh, they loved the film and, and they loved how authentic it felt, down to little details like you know, we would, they would put their empty recyclables in these milk crates and put them in alleys. Well, we have that in a lot of shots in the film, which I, we didn't even know. We didn't even ask our production designer to do it. They just did it. But they were so appreciative of those little details like that because it just made them feel like we did our homework, you know? We yeah, had we would a love great to take crew. Yeah, we had that, a great crew. Exactly. Paul, Paul Felix and Scott Watanabe, yeah. uh, our production designer and art director, they, uh, well, Scott was kind of a secret weapon. Yeah. Because Scott grew up in San Francisco and is Japanese American and, he spent his summers in Japan, so it was like having this, yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> double threat. I mean, yeah, and I, I've only been here three years in San Francisco, and just even just the feel of just the weather and the fog and yeah. the mist and the lighting, like everything is very, very specific to San Francisco. We were uh, we were tried very hard to capture the lighting because it was j important to John Lasseter because when we first pitched this idea, he's like, you got to go up and you got to study the light because the light in San Francisco is like no other place. So we did send a team up here, and and they were on you know rooftops of buildings taking like you know, uh, time-lapse photos of the light, you know, all through the day, and we use that a lot in the film. Even the, the placement of the sun in the sky is accurate to San Francisco, depending on the time of day of the scene. Like, they go really deep. And it's important to make note of this, be, because before we try to construct the story, we try to, we build the world. Mm -hmm. And, because uh, the story is something that over the course of the years of production is gonna evolve quite a bit. We, we work in a very iterative way. The story is always gonna, gonna change but you're kind of stuck with the world you create. So before we do that, we go back and do tons and tons of research and, and our art, direction, art director, production designer really immerse themselves in, in this world and, and they sketch a lot and they, and they take pictures and they really immerse themselves. And that's why it feels so complete and it feels like the world has a history to it. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, even this poster we have kind of sitting back there, you know, a uh, production oh, yeah. designer to make it all turn around. But it, it, it's just a beautiful just sunset uh, with Baymax and, and uh, Hero. And, your character has an awesome scene with Baymax where you guys are flying around the city and kind of yeah. testing him out. And there's a, there's a beautiful little part in there. It's not even acting on your part. I know it's an animator, but it's a beautiful little scene with Hero where it's, you catch a reflection in the, you know, in the building. And it's so, it's so subtle, but yeah. it's, it's an amazing moment for the character to just kind of be like, oh, this is awesome. Look, no, look what no, I'm doing. No. It's, it's funny you say that because that's something I do in my everyday life. Yeah. And I'm trying to find out which of the animators put that in there because they watch you know, hours and hours of, of me in the booth and then watch my, you know, they watch my face and what my body does. And um, when, I, when I look at something and I think it's cool or I, th I think it's entertaining or funny, I almost do this laugh to myself. It's like, huh. And I, I do that. And when Hiro does it twice in the film, he does it when he's on the back of Tadashi's moped. He, you know, they hit up and then he's looking next to like the glass and he sees himself, he does a laugh. And then it, that scene parallels with the, the, the first flight scene where he's on the back of Baymax and he's going around the city and he sees himself in the mirror again, well, in the glass. 
And it was just so bizarre watching the film when those two things, I missed the first one the first time around. But when I saw the one where he's on the back of Baymax, blew my mind. Because mm -hmm. some, some animator saw me do that in the booth and they put it into the film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's such a cool part. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. That's the first time I cried. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that scene. But not the last. Behind yeah. the 3D glasses. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, it's, it's such an incredible scene. It just kind of gets to the actual, it makes these characters alive and they're actual yeah. human beings. You know, they're not computer or data, they're actual human yeah. beings. And seeing that little moment, he could just be flying around, but he's actually seeing how cool it is. Just, yeah. the, you know, a complete teenager thing to do. It's a total testament to our animators. So we've got the greatest animation team, I think, in the business right now who, who are, are able, you yeah. know, to yeah. take human characters and make them come alive. I mean, yeah. oftentimes I'll be talking to people and they'll say, you know, I forgot I was watching an animated film. And you know, it's not photo real. It's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's totally mm. exaggerated in the way a, a, an animated film should be, yeah. but you, f you, you emotionally it, it, you fall in love with these characters and you just go with it. And you know, and for those little moments of, of uh, spontaneity, we really rely, in big moments, we really rely on, on these guys, we rely on yeah. the past, because mm -hmm. the way animation works, it's so, everything is so meticulously planned. Everything you see on the screen, every little crack on the sidewalk is a choice that somebody made. Mm -hmm. um, and so the one place where we can find spontaneity is in the recording booth and with these guys. And they so inhabited the characters and, and, and brought them to life. And so we're, we're, we're very, very grateful to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, so Jensen, Jimmy, that must have been actually interesting too because you watch yourself on screen in live action films and you obviously see yourself. But now you're seeing these characters up on screen. So do you see any little bits that the animators took out from you guys? I mean, they got the nerd aspect <laughs> right on. The first thing I said. Like, I totally nerded out in the room, and yeah. I acted a fool for with you guys <laughs> for like four hours. And I saw some of the kookiness and you know the lip biting thing, and just the the, the mad scientist that we did in the room. <laughs> they captured that. <laughs> we needed to give Genesis lots of room. There, yeah. we, we moved things out of the we'll way. All very <laughs> uh, very active. <laughs> now, were any of you guys together during the recording process? No, not at all. I, we met less than a month ago. Oh my gosh! For the first time at a cast mm -hmm. dinner. Yeah, it's it's hard to do um, yeah. that just because everybody's schedules and our, and our production schedules. In a perfect world, would be awesome though. I mean, to get everybody and, and record at the same time. No. I worked with uh, Maya Rudolph, who, who voices uh, and cast mm -hmm. for about twenty minutes. <laughs> that, was about, that was about it. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's. It was fun. It was fun being able to work with another actor, but with with voiceover, I think. I think what's so amazing about it is it's because it's just yourself. It's you have so much freedom to play around because mm -hmm. usually in live action you're worried about uh, someone maybe messing up a line or uh, what's my body look like on camera. Well, well, you know, you have all these things to worry about with voice. It's just it's it's simply your voice. So you can you run around the room. You can do cartwheels as long as you're you know y the voice matches mm -hmm. is all that matters. Yeah, and to expand on that, I feel like with you know, the difference between doing a live action film and, and doing an animation film is you have the luxury of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Don's been with this project for, for many, many years, and for them to continually protect, uh, you know, uh, perfect it. And same thing with the characters, you know, we have that luxury. No, I, th I think that's a great thing about Disney and, you know, Pixar does it too, where you guys, you guys don't stunt cast. It's not like you're like, let's get Brad Pitt, let's get Tom Cruise in there. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's you guys find the perfect people because you guys just blend perfectly in with these characters, you know, and you, again, I think it goes to the realism of the characters, but you really believe these characters are alive about hiding that voice in the character, and they are, you are hero, and you are go-go, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible. I, I really feel that way. Pretty early on in the process, it became impossible to imagine anyone else playing right. these characters. They just really inhabited them, mm -hmm. and, and you have to remember, these, these guys have to conjure up everything. They don't have a costume, they don't have a set, they don't have the other actors uh, to bounce off of, and, and if it was a live action thing, you would probably come to the, to the set to do one scene that day. Uh, whereas we have them race from scene to scene to scene in the course of one recording session. The whole movie, basically. And yeah. So, yeah. So it might be a comedic scene followed by a very emotional scene with, with, with great tragedy. And they're forced to sort, of, to sort of nimbly sort of shift from one thing to another. And I'm always really amazed. And we're all exhausted by the end of uh, each recording session. <laughs> no, I bet. I bet. Um, you know, it's it's an incredible film, really, about a boy really coming of age, and and these teenagers and these college students really coming of age. And there's this beautiful, uh, really interesting part, which I've never really done seen done in animation before. Where I'm not going to spoil it for people who haven't seen the movie, but th there's a part where a, a particular character just does a complete 180. You know, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. completely 
changes, and I haven't seen that before, especially from you know uh, definitely one of the main characters. And it's it's so interesting because it's it's a real emotion, right? Like I think it's something that's very specific to someone who is young who gets put into these very difficult situations who has to have these real human emotions. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, so that. That's an interesting part, mm -hmm. and yeah. I kind of want I, without kind of spoiling I what it is. Sorry, I know, it's a little tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah but <laughs> we're we're very, yeah. we're very proud of that scene too, and and it does kind of plumb uh, some some of the darker depths uh, of this particular character, um, and uh, you know it was one of those scenes that you know as we animated it, we were we kept we kept shifting things like we would it, it came across in the animation we thought oh man this is really powerful, and then when it came time to score it and mix it, we found that taking out the sound effects and just letting the score play actually really made it land emotionally. So it was one of those, it kind of kept evolving throughout our process. Yeah, I think that um, the idea that Hero inherits his brother's robot and then wants to turn him into something other than what he was intended to be uh, is actually a lot of the fun and the comedy of the movie, but yeah. we knew inevitably it would lead to a terrible choice. And we knew it wouldn't be true to not do that. And, and, but it's a challenge. We, we, we were asking the audience to suddenly sever from their main character and not like what he was doing. Uh, but, but we knew it had to be in the film, and, and so I, I, we, we took it on, and hopefully we did it artfully. Well, I think that was the, that was the great thing, is that it was completely unexpected. Well, you know? You know, that, and it's a testament to you two guys, to Don and Chris. I mean, I think there's some really brave filmmaking going on. Yeah. Uh, you know the fact that they, oh, yeah, that's very <laughs> shocking. Uh, the fact that they do not depend on sound effects, they do not depend on uh, score. They actually let moments go silent. You know, which I think in animation is really important because it is a visual art form, mm -hmm. and they really play into the strengths of animation, and also the power of emotion, and not try and gimmick it up. And that's. You two guys, you're great. Yeah. Thanks, Roy. Thanks, you're Roy. welcome. Got a lot of goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> now, was there a lot of pressure? Because you know Disney's kind of in this new golden age of animation again, kind of back in the '90s when it was The Little Mermaid and Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast, and now you have Tangled, which was just an amazing film, and you Wreck It Ralph and Frozen. You know, is there a lot of pressure to succeed? Like after Frozen comes out, does Lasher come in and like, oh my gosh, we need a ballad with Baymax, you know, singing? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> with the cigar the whole night <laughs> comes in. Uh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I mean, the pressure is really more internal than external, to be honest with you. And, and the fact that we, we grew up Disney fans, our whole building is full of, of fans, and, and some, somewhere in their childhood, they were emotionally um, touched by a Disney film, and that made them want to work there, right? And so the pressure is strictly, can we make a film that is a Disney film but is fresh and new, and can it sit on the shelf with those other you know, classics. And so really it was more of an internal pressure than any kind of external pressure. Yeah, we don't compete with uh, other Disney movies in that way. We're actually a pretty small community at, at Disney Animation and we all work on each other's movies. Mm -hmm. And so any one movie's success is everyone's success. And so, yeah, we, we're not worried about trying to make more money than Frozen. There is no such thing as more money than Frozen. All the money. <laughs> all the money. <laughs> but, but what is important is that we have a relationship with the audience. You know, yeah. they, they track Disney feature animated films. And we want them to believe that if they come to see one of our movies, whatever the genre we're taking on, that they'll have a great experience. That's what's most important. And that's the thing that kind of keeps me up at night. Uh, I think the strength of the studio right now is the fact that you know, Don was working on Winnie the Pooh and decided he wanted to do a superhero movie. <laughs> that sp split, you know, and for me, I had done Tangled and the next thing I do is a superhero movie. Mm -hmm. That's great, and that's, that's the strength of our studio right now in terms of storytelling, and it's all about the storytelling, and, and whenever we make a choice, it's about what's the best story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's. It, I think that's incredible too. Uh, you know, with you guys as the voice cast and stuff, with your guys' costumes, did you have any say over that stuff? Any little bits and pieces of it, or, or not really? Zero. <laughs> I want wardrobe though, so I yeah. hope that happens for me because it's absolutely adorable. It is. Adorable. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. And I want to talk about, a little bit about that with the costumes and their and their powers and everything, because you know you have. <laughs> You, the, you know, Wasabi, he has basically lightsaber hands, is essentially what he has. Uh, Fred has a, is a fire-breathing monster. You know, Baymax has his karate skills, and Gogo has the, you know, wheel discs. Honey has the purse bombs, and... Purse bombs, uh, I like that. Oh, God, it's not That's terrible, awesome. right? No, purse no, no, bombs. I like it. Um, balls, we call yeah. them. Yeah. Don't uh, scream that in TSA. But, <laughs> <laughs> purse bomb! But the... the 
incredible thing with Hero is that actually he doesn't have anything. He just has his suit and Baymax, and mm. he needs Baymax. And Symbiotic. that was very particular and very specific to your character, where it was, you're kind of nothing without, but not nothing, but you're not, you need Baymax. Well, yeah. it, it, it's funny. You go, you go all the way back to kind of the origin of Big Hero 6, and you see Hero's role. And um, it's still very much the same thing from the comic book till the film. He is, he is the strategist. He is the guy who figures out the plan. Um, and he's the guy that, you know, um, he's basically like it, these guys form like Voltron and um, stealing a line from the Wu Tang clan, Hero is the head. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, you know, he, he doesn't have any, you know, he, does, he, didn't, he didn't add anything to his suit except for the fact that he connects to Baymax. Um, and yeah, I mean, you, when you watch the film, you, you hear him kind of call out, oh, do this, do that. And um, it, it, it's great because everyone's powers, they come together really nicely. And everyone's skills and um, their intellect come together in a way that they can work together as a team really well. And it was important uh, early on, you know, when we first started developing it, that um, I just made a choice um, to, to not have super-powered beings in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like there was a lot of that. And uh, I like the challenge of creating, the, really the superpower in the movie is their intelligence. It's super mm -hmm. tech, really, and, and the smarts of, the, of these characters. And, and uh, it, it led us down, you know, interesting, because it made us research more. And boy, I mean, we found, you know, so many really cool maglev technology. We researched that and, uh, you know, even telekinesis for Heroes Microbots, which we thought was a crazy sci-fi kind of thing. Turns out that, you know, there are people working on some rudimentary uh, aspects of telekinesis. So probably, probably us, right? Probably. probably. <laughs> <coughs> Google. Um, so, but uh, you know, and I think it paid off in that the, you know that they do feel you know they're they're mortal beings. They're just kids. They're just college. Really, Gogo is really the only one that has any business being a superhero. To be honest with you, she carries the team yeah. for a while. Kind of carries them a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it is a sort of celebration of sort of the maker movement and, and super technology. Yeah. Yeah, they're all smart. I mean, they're all smart kids, and we celebrate that, and, and they have a lot of potential. And that's one of the things the movie talks about is, is that each of us has potential, and what are you going to do with it? Are you going to do something selfish or selfless with it? And, and if this movie in any way inspires scientific curiosity, then that's, then that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the, I do want to double back, because these guys may not think they had anything to do with actually the look of their character. But essentially, their performances are what finally shape the character. Oh, yeah, sure. We don't do, you know, we, we don't do anything with the character until we have that voice, and so you know, slight design changes and you know all kinds of things in terms of costume, it's all a result of your performance. Oh. Yeah, and the body language as well. Mm -hmm. yes. No, absolutely. Yeah. To know. Uh, you know, what was kind of the balance of, you know, you're taking this very obscure Marvel property yeah. and trying to translating that into, you know, uh, you know, you guys, you know, Disney Marvel just did it with Guardians of the Galaxy, you mm -hmm. guys are doing it with Big Hero 6, kind of introducing this and kind of finding that balance of respecting the original property but also making it your own. And because, you know, looking back at the original, because I didn't really know it and I was yeah. looking at it, and some of it crosses, but some of it, you know, some <laughs> characters are different mm -hmm. and... Yeah. I mean, Baymax is <laughs> completely <laughs> way better than the original. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said that, not us. Uh, well, in, 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 it, it actually came from one of the first meetings we had with Marvel when we, when you know, I pitched several ideas to John based on Marvel ideas, and he gravitated towards Big Hero Six, and as did the other directors. You know, we we generally pitch stuff to all the other directors. We all kind of work on each other's stuff, you know, and everybody seemed to gravitate towards Big Hero Six, and uh, uh, Marvel was super cool with it, and they just said, "Don't worry." You don't have to worry about setting this in the Marvel Universe. You don't have to worry about Iron Man and Captain America and everybody showing up. You know, they really encouraged us to make it our own, and that's what led to San Francisco. If it's not the Marvel Universe, which is generally New York City in the, in the real world, <laughs> um, you know, then what is our world? That led to San Francisco. And, and ultimately, you know, they, were, they gave us you know, complete freedom to kind of make this our own. And so it, we ended up you know, really kind of taking the characters' names, and we tried to base their tech on something from the comic book. Mm -hmm. Loosely, um, but Baymax really w is a is a kind of a whole new character, and that came from our research. You know, I did a robotics tour very early on, about three and a half years ago, actually, and uh, uh, Harvard, MIT, and actually Carnegie Mellon was where I found a researcher named Chris Atkinson who was doing research in soft robotics. And you guys are probably working on it too, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I met Chris Atkinson, and and uh, you know I'd never seen anything. I was on the hunt for something unique. I you know I knew it was going to be a challenge to put a you know, a unique robot on screen. We've seen so many. Uh, and not only that, but he had to be appealing and, and huggable. 
everybody kept saying, it's got to be a huggable robot. So when I saw that soft robotics, I, that's when I knew we'd found our Baymax. And so his, his character, his personality, everything from Baymax came from that research trip. Oh, and, and the fact that it, it stems from a more obscure property has actually really served us because mm -hmm. it meant the audience wasn't going to bring any preconceived notions about what the character should be or what the story should be. Mm -hmm. Because one thing you can't emphasize enough is how fluid our story environment is. We spend years crafting the story, and it changes quite a bit over the course of that journey. And the whole system is designed to be constantly questioning your assumptions about the story. And so it changes dramatically. So you, one thing you know is whatever you start out with, you're going to end up with something else at the end of the journey. So better to start with something that people don't have a fixed idea of what it should be. Interesting. Now, for you know, the development of the characters, you kind of brought in that you know, the story's constantly changing. You guys are probably brought in, I'm guessing, several times to do audio. Okay. Now, is there any thought to bringing in these actors, maybe even sooner, maybe even earlier in the process, kind of when you're developing the characters, or you still just trying to find them and find their voice, but would it be easier almost to find the actors first and then kind of develop the character from there? Or well, they are of part of the process. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, for, for, for years, you guys have been involved, right? For a year and a half or so. Oh, wow. okay. Is that right? I mean, yeah, even when they auditioned, I mean, we had pages, but it was kind of like, okay, take it and do whatever, you know. I really encourage them to bring uh, a lot of themselves to it and, and bring any kind of improv, because, again, that keeps it fresh and, and yeah. for us. And when they were not, the characters were definitely not baked when, when you guys came in. I mean, you had huge impact on defining these characters. And, and yeah, the, 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 the structure will be always evolving. The scenes will be changing. So you guys will be asked to come in and re-record yeah. the scene over and over and over again. And I've always that really happen? impressed by your <laughs> patience. <laughs> that happened? <laughs> yeah. We probably didn't Brian have these, how many recording sessions with you? 15? Uh, oh, 16? More than 20. More. And they really? could be four or five hour yeah. sessions. And it was pretty demanding. Yeah. And you guys never lost faith, I felt. You know what I mean? No, and, it, and you had every reason to, I think, yeah. because you're seeing scenes change over and over and over again. Yeah, so and thank the, you. Yeah, being able to come in so many times, I was able to see how the script evolved. And I just saw it was it kept going. Like I, I already thought it was phenomenal. But then it just kept evolving and becoming better and better and better. And um, I mean, every, every, t every time I came in, it was just I was happy to, to see that I, that it could get better. I don't know. It was weird. I was like, it's not going to get any better than this. And it did. And it's, it's an interesting thing for you, because uh, your character is in most of the film. So you saw most of the script, because these guys only see really the chunks <laughs> of the script that yeah. they're in. And so you know, he was able to see the kind of arc developing. You guys probably had a little bit more, hmm, what's yeah. going on here? Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad you guys were able to finally uh, settle on an opening of the film. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the last thing you do. It's always, the last, <laughs> always thing. the last thing you do. There were always so many the versions thing. of the yeah. first scene of the movie. Yeah. Sorry but about uh, that. To, to Roy's point, though, we never re I, I wouldn't say we ever really have a finished script you know, um, to, to hand out because, because of that evolution. I mean, there may be. Uh, a complete script at one point, but it's never done in in our terms, you know. And so we can't really ever hand out a finished script because it doesn't exist really until the movie's done. We keep iterating and iterating and iterating, and right. and so there's no version of like a shooting script, you know, in live yeah. action. In in a sense, it's the shooting script is like when it's done, you know, just, right. and it's that's the shooting script. Oh well, yeah, oh there it is. Yeah, right there. <laughs> it's there all the time. <laughs> and, and for you three, you know, with with. Anytime you're acting, you're always a character, right? And so what were kind of your inspirations of trying to bring these characters to life? You know, was it yourself? Was it a sibling? Was it another actor? Was it something from your childhood? You know, what was kind of bringing about? Because um, obviously you're not, you know, 14 and, you know, 20-year-olds, you know, <laughs> in college. Um, man, it's, it's funny because um, everyone keeps asking the question, how are you similar to your character? And, well, we, I don't really have any differences from Hero other than the fact that he's, he's much smarter than I am. <laughs> uh, but, but, in certain but, ways. In certain ways. But besides that, we're so, I mean, we're so similar. And even, obviously, the body language and you know, the way you, you see Hero on screen, that's attributed to the animators. Um, but I didn't have to change my voice at all for the project. It's my voice through and through. And... What was written on the page, I feel like th it's things I've already gone through, things I've already experienced, um, things I've said, even. And um, obviously, when I was able to improv, I was able to bring more of myself to him. But honestly, every time I went in, there was nothing I had to do. All I did was walk through the door. They started recording, and I read lines off, off a page. And it was just, it was me. Yeah, I think you're going to see a parallel, because there's a reason why they hired us. Thank God. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, so you're going to see some resemblances. but. 
I feel like for my character, you know, they gave me a great direction, and it was, she's, she's the female version of Clint Eastwood. You know, she doesn't <laughs> have a lot to say, but when she says it, it's just straight to the point. Um, so that was really helpful. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is you had the easiest job because you only had... So easy. <laughs> <laughs> you had to learn to skate, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we had to ask her to be mean sometimes. It was, yeah. it was sort yeah. of breaking away from who you actually mean. are, I think. More mean. <laughs> More mean. <laughs> you kept pushing her. Yeah. Nastier, nastier. <laughs> so was there any room for improvisation? Because you mentioned that. So you got to improv a little bit? Oh, yeah. yeah. For sure. I mean, did I... Did, what, did I? Even yeah, I there's, there's sections where I, you just I say. Kinda, it's a blur because <laughs> I walked in, I had so much fun, and I was like, I can't believe I worked today, and I got paid for it. <laughs> so. All you guys would say, can I try something? And the answer is always yes. Yeah. It always has to be yes because you might get great stuff, and also you want to see, see their interpretation of the scene, the moment, the character, and you want to create that environment where, where everyone's point of view is, is worth listening to. So, yeah, it was, you guys offered so much great stuff that was but, off page. Good. <laughs> it, it, I did that. It's also cool to see it in the final, in, in, when, when it's done, you go, oh, my line made it. <laughs> like, you're like, oh, no way. Yes. I, they, they approve. Um, you know, it, TJ, I'm, I'm sure, was just uh, just constantly. No, know, he stuck to the script the whole time. Oh, the, the whole time. Yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Five, man. Oh, great. No, TJ's a crazy uh, man. Isn't him and Scott too, yeah. right? Yep. Well, Scott, interestingly enough, though, was probably the most scripted character because Baymax, you know, he, we were pretty strict with him and and how he, his syntax and how he speaks and and it was it was all very kind of scripted out. And Scott is such a, an amazing actor and improver that he could find nuances within lines to make them funny. Or actually to make them, you know, tug at your heartstrings, you know, and and that's his testament to how you know because we really kind of hemmed him in as far as uh, tight his, envelope. Yeah, he had a very tight envelope with which to, to act, but he did a great job. Yeah, I was going to ask about Banks because I know Scott's not here, but his character is it's so interesting, like his voice and how how do you even find Scott? Because it's <laughs> it's got to be hard to cast a voice because you're probably yeah. going with. You know, trying to figure out what's going to be a robot yeah. voice. You know, I we looked at yeah, I looked at several, <laughs> a lot, just a few, right? Uh, <laughs> Forty-ish, or I don't know. <laughs> but uh, and and you know, there was a certain, it definitely had something in mind. You know, that that it, it had to be that kind of calm, soothing, kind of peaceful, you know, cheerful uh, tone because he's a nurse and he, that's how he views the world and 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 so we were, it was really looking for like the, the right tonality. And then when Scott came in, he was really good at. He brought that idea of, um, you know, like when you call um, a call center and it's not a human being on the other end. <laughs> yeah. And there's always that weird pause in between words, you know. Scott mm -hmm. brought that in there and, and it seemed to really fit the character. And was there anything that was really just so crazy and wild but you really wanted it in the film but it just didn't fit or you just got to cut it or... Well, that's a hard question. There were scenes that followed the villain's plot a little more. Yeah. That were really fun and cinematic, but ultimately didn't serve the story, so mm -hmm. they they had to go. Yeah, you just can't, you know, when you're making an animated film, uh, unlike a live action film, you know, there is a, you know, we are generally in the 85 to 90 minute range, and can't really go too much beyond that um, for many reasons, actually. And so it does make you like be like you have to sort of kill your babies as far as like, okay, does that work? Does it not? Does that further the story? Does it not? And and you got to be really um, kill your hardcore, you know. <laughs> uh, kill your darlings, or whatever. Darlings. You know, everybody darlings. knows the term. <laughs> Brian's uh, like, whoa, whoa. It's the family. Uh, but uh, so we, you know, you do have to make those tough choices. So there were, yeah, we did follow the villain story a little bit, and there were very cool cinematic scenes, but um, I just didn't further hero's emotional story, which had to be the main story. So was there any point where you just got completely stuck and you were just, this is not going to work? Because I know every film basically <laughs> yeah. at, at its oh, yeah. you know, initial every birth day. is just it's. You know, it's not good. For yeah. sure, yeah. I mean, okay. the the we we put up a series of screenings, which are story reels, um, uh, storyboards with music and, and dialogue and sound effects, and and we put up I think seven or eight versions of yeah, the story reels internally over the course of making the movie. And at the after every screening, uh, you get lots of opinions and lots of ideas, and lots of feedback, and you're in a position to do lots of soul searching. Mm. Um, about what you think is working, what's not working, what your vision of the film was, what it now has to be, because that's constantly evolving as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there there are moments where you think, well, I don't know if we can crack this one. You know, we're, we, this was a very ambitious story, uh, plot-wise, and as far as the emotional storyline, very ambitious. 
Um, and, and there were certainly moments where we thought, boy, I don't know if we're going to be able to crack this one. But somebody would keep talking. You know, yeah. so we just keep going. And, yeah. and, the, and the machine would just keep, we, we, there's about eight or 10 people in that story room uh, sit, sitting across the table from each other uh, for days on end. And then that process goes for years. And, uh, and somebody will always be that spark plug that fires up the conversation and keeps it going. And, and we all fire off uh, of each other. And so um, there might have been those, those moments of, of doubt, but we're the, with the people that we're surrounded by, it doesn't take very long. We're very fortunate in the sense that we have this story trust, and it's all the directors that work on all the films. And you know, we, we meet after every screening and have these great off-sites and, and, and discuss um, you know, specific notes. But there were two moments that I remember that were really uh, essential. We did one off-site, and we brought in uh, a psychologist and a couple of social workers to talk about teenage loss. And that really kind of solidified hero story in, in our minds. That kind of like took us in the right direction. And then the other moment was when we discovered that it was really Baymax who had to drive the story. He was the one who actually gets the team together. And once that happened, then kind of the pieces started falling into place. Fell, yeah. That happened around the fourth screening. Um, oh, wow. And so then the next you know, four screenings were about getting all the other elements functioning. Absolutely. We're going to do some Q&A as well. Uh, if people want to start getting up to the microphone, but if you have any questions. But you know, something I want to talk about, too, is what was just your guys' favorite part of the movie? You know, I, I, there was a few of those, and there's a couple parts where you know, Disney socks you in the gut, and you just start crying. You know? And it's just yeah. it's, it, it's some heartbreaking moments. But there's got to be some, you know, the hero scene and stuff. But what, what you know, seeing your reflection. But you know, Roy, we'll kind of start with you and kind of go you, the line. You know, the scene that I love the most is when they're walking into the uh, hall for the showcase. And it's they're they're rolling in the microbots in the uh, in the um, uh, little containers, and it's just it's the team it's the team together just goofing around and talking and trying to pep him up, and it's so real and it's so gentle and yet you know it's it's a bunch of kids just shooting the breeze you know and it just for that moment I I see them together for the first time I see them as a team. I see them as friends. I see them as buds, you know. And it, it, it's, it's a kind of a special scene, and it's simple. Right now, we, we, yeah, we already touched on it. I mean, my, my favorite thing of the whole film was actually that was that look when I look, when Hero looks into uh, into the glass and he basically does what I do in, in my everyday life. Um, but I, I, the opening is a great scene. Um, it's just it's a lot of fun. Um, the first flight sequence is great. Ryan, just one. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan. Say so. Ryan, you are not <laughs> listening. We can talk and then the end, and then this, and <laughs> and there's just so many great moments. There yeah. really are. Um, my favorite scene is uh, when you see the team trying out their gear and perfecting it with Heathcliff. <laughs> That's very funny to me. <laughs> Your character is very sweet in that scene. Yeah, yeah. 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 she's very sweet. <laughs> Drunk Baymax. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like low battery Baymax is probably the funniest scenes ever. Yeah. Whoever um, I would just keep them on low. Yeah, just hang out with them. <laughs> just you, like the, you like the drunk version better? Yeah. yeah he's cool. I prefer he's, the he's drunk. He says some the Baymax. funny things. He is I mean, funny. he's hilarious, yeah. Um, well, there, there's a, a couple scenes that I actually don't want to talk about too much because mm -hmm. of spoilers and things, but um, one scene that, that I love, and it's, I think it's a credit to the way that we build our stories, is after the, uh, the first flight scene where Hero's riding on Baymax around the city for the first time, there's a very quiet moment where they're sitting on top of wind turbine above the clouds. And, uh, and there's, there's uh, a stillness and, a, and I think a, a very uh, a, a good kind of sentimentality to that scene. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of it. And it's, it's a scene that came very late in the game for us. Um, it was only after years of, 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 all, of the story evolving and working on the structure that we realized that, that we, were, we were missing something. We were missing that scene. And once we had it, we couldn't imagine how we ever had a, had a version of the movie without it. Yeah. Um, so I love that scene, and I, and I love what it says uh, about our process that it even exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, for me, the first flight sequence is, uh, was the near and dear to my heart. And it was in every version of every screening we ever did. And, uh, and it never really integrated until we came up. It was John Lasser, actually, that came up with the idea that, that Baymax was going to kind of go on a daredevil uh, flight through San Francisco in order to boost Hero's neurotransmitter levels and, and get him to 
feel excited. And, uh, but it also, to me, was the ultimate, this movie to me is like, I, there are moments in this film where I'm like eight years old. And I, and I know how I would feel about watching that in the theater. And that's one of those scenes where I just know my eight-year-old self would go bananas for it. So mm. my favorite scene. So, so that's interesting, because I was going to ask about that, too. So there, that scene was in a, through every iteration. So it was. were there it a couple of those? It didn't work until we came, John came up with that idea. Um, well, like if, for instance, the beginning of the film with the bot fight, that was in the first version of the couple of versions of the film, and then kind of went away and meandered back right. in. And that often happens, you know, just because we're trying out stuff. and, and you, Throw it away. It doesn't work in this context, but then you pull it back out, and it now it works in a new context. So the first flight was in every version first of the flight. movie. It just needed the right context. Yeah, exactly. And you need it, right? I yeah. mean, with these yeah. characters. Yeah. And you know, Roy, you could probably you know jump in here too with the technological challenges because you have Baymax is something I don't think we've really seen in terms of a character. No. I mean, he's, he's crazy, you know. And I'm sure that character rig must have been crazy for the animators. And then you also have uh, the you know microbots, which are just uh, this beautiful amazing thing of them coming together. I kind of want to talk about the technological challenges with that and making that all kind of stuff. Yeah, it's, well, you're, you're, you're hitting two great teams that we have. One is Tech Anim. They, they basically work after animation and make sure that that vinyl was actually vinyl. I mean, it is amazing. The folds. What, you know, yeah, the so. folds and how the vinyl moves. That's all Tech Anim, and it's just an amazing team that we work with. And then our effects team, who came up with so much in, in this film. I mean, you know, it's kind of interesting. If you were to take um, San Francisco and the world that we built in this film, you could fit Tangled, you could fit Wreck-It Ralph, and you could fit Frozen into this world. It, it was so amazing what they were able to accomplish just in terms of you know, uh, rendering power, in terms of the animation and all the, the nuance that's there. It's, it's brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's visually beautiful. I mean, it's just crazy. And again, Baymax is just one of those characters I don't think we've ever seen on screen before. Yeah. You know, and some of the crazy the stuff goal. we're doing. We were yeah. rendering like 1.1 million hours per night. We had 50,000 cores running this thing. I mean, it was it's insane. <laughs> yeah. Insane. Yeah. You, know, and, you know, kind of one of the last things, because we got to wrap it up. I don't think there's anyone for the Q&A. But uh, for uh, the, you know, there's a lot of Easter eggs and a lot of harkbacks to, yeah. I think, oh, yeah. well, you know, sure. I, I kind of want to tell viewers, you know, I, I think basically in Fred's room I saw a ton of stuff. Yeah. A little bit in Heroes. Yeah. The big window, I'm not going to reveal what it is, but the big window, is that designed after something in Hero's room? The round window? Yeah. I don't know. Was it Donnie? It looks like a Pokemon ball. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know if that's intentional or not. Are you talking about in Tadashi's lab? Or yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 lab. yeah. Actually, no. You know what? That was from a research. Uh, um, there is a robotics lab at um, MIT that I visited that had that kind of turret-like window, kind of like the Millennium Falcon kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that always stuck in my head and oh, based well. it on that. But we can say Pokemon. That's oh, totally there cool. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> together. But there are lots of Easter eggs, and we yeah. have lots of Marvel fans, and obviously people proud of the Disney history yeah. in our building. And so they were placing lots of Easter eggs to the point where Don and I had to tell them to knock it off. Right. <laughs> there were just too many. We actually pulled a couple out. Yeah. Lock it down. <laughs> Great, great. Um, I think that's all we have time for because we've got to wrap this up. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Uh, so, everyone, the, uh, the movie comes out uh, Friday, November 7th, so just a few days. And uh, if you guys are going to watch this and everything, make sure you, you know, promote it on social media, G+, Facebook. If you're going on uh, hashtagging it, uh, hashtag Big Hero 6, the number 6. And, uh, oh, we have one gift, and so if you want to grab that, Roy, this is for you guys. Uh, you guys saw us a little bit earlier. We have a Baymax... Uh, Android. So cool. <laughs> Figure for you guys, they all sign that's going back to the cast and crew of Bay, uh, Big Hero 6 back in Disney. So, oh, thank you guys for being here. It. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you man. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.